Right, so the intention of the design was a well-being monitor for people who've got dementia um, as, they, as they pass through the stages. Now, if this works, it's up, or that way, up, there we are. So the context is all about activities of daily living and how one's abilities and capabilities decline over the years. So there is these certain things that are um, important to keep going and living independently. Cutting your own toenails is apparently one of the first signs that there may be problems. Start of the decline. Being able to go, oh, sh oh what did I do there? Shopping. I touched something and I shouldn't have done. Full screen mode. There we are, shopping. <laughs> using steps and stairs if you lose the ability to do that and walking 400 yards. Now the top here, right, is self-care. You know, no sort of monitoring is necessarily going to help. But you can see, unless you actually do something about keeping active and mobile and flexible, right, you're possibly losing five years right, of good lifestyle. So the time to do early intervention and getting fitter and active is <coughs> early on and it will save you or your family £1,900 per year. These figures are coming from Newcastle University Institute of Ageing, so they're statistically accurate figures that we're working with. Um, the next stage is inability to do heavy housework or gardening, washing, cooking a hot meal, moving around the house, getting in and out of chairs where you might start wanting assistance from friends or family, light housework, uh, transfer from toilet. So at this stage, it's family, friends and carers who might be looking after you and making sure you're warm and fed and, and, and keeping active. One of the things I said, you shouldn't do shopping for people, you should maybe accompany them as they go shopping. Right? So inactivity is really bad. It encourages some sort of decline. Um, ability to get dressed and transferring from bed. You're probably going to need some form of domiciliary care. So this is a rapid decline when you may have to go into a residential home after an average of seven years. This is the decline which is very slow to start off with and then more rapid, but it could be 10 years before you have to go into domiciliary care. So, <coughs> I said, dementia is part of it. Here, you may or may not have dementia. Later on, you may not accept the logic of doing things that are, that are good for you. This is where well-being monitoring would come in, from about self-caring to the point where you, you're getting regular visits. The sort of monitor we've got, which is, which is this, continuous recording and measuring data <coughs> um, and it's, it's of less use but could be used. Um, no early intervention cost about £15,000 a year extra for that person. That one? Ah, oh, that one. Uh, these are some figures we got from the FTM benchmarking survey and the significance of this is how many days you're in hospital if either you're trying to spur it from your own home where you lived originally back into your own home from a care home to a hospital back into a care home or from your own home into a care home so it's quite staggering it's about two and a half times longer to stay in hospital now, there's a lot of reasons for this there's DPOC, which is uh, Delayed Transfers of Care. You know about these? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are loads and loads of statistics, right, about it, and the National Health Service has got some things. But anyway, when you look at those averages, 12.3 days home to home, home to care home, about 31.7 days on average. <coughs> so, it's really important to the health service to get for people, encourage people to stay in their own homes. 
looking at it another way, why, why are these numbers important? If you are unwell or not very fit when you go into hospital, there's a chance that you may have to be stabilised. They can't even treat you. So if you've had a fall and lying three days on the floor, you've probably got dehydration, malnutrition, you can't actually get the treatment. So the outcome is going to be much worse. The treatment is going to be longer and possibly more complex. And the bed blocking is also longer as well. So average of 31.7 days. If you get back to assisted independent living, the treatment is shorter, bed blocking is shorter, you're going to be happier if you're an older person. And there's significant differences in cost. Each of those periods of treatment or bed blocking, the numbers are well known and the average is anywhere about £600 a day during treatment, £235 a day for bed blocking. Uh, care homes are going to cost anyway, but also does domestic and domiciliary care. So these are average figures from the industry. The significance is that this area, social care and, and assisted living, more and more people are going to have to pay for this themselves. So we've been to a number of councils and they say all their discretionary payments for social care, the budget is gone. So the pressure now is for families or older people to pay for their own uh, telecare, essentially. So with wellbeing monitoring, you should be healthier before admission. There's attention every day better health outcomes after discharge and approximately £5,000 saving to the NHS if you convert somebody from care home to their own, <coughs> returning to their own home. Feel free to ask questions if, if you wish. Um, why, why are the outcomes poor if you don't have early attention? Key ones, hypothermia, too cold, um, older people think they can't afford to heat themselves, they may forget to drink or give up drinking, they don't have a friend around to have a cup of tea so they don't take enough liquid in, malnutrition, poor food, you know, not going out shopping, not getting enough fresh vegetables or whatever it is, unattended falls, they always hit the headlines, um, your condition gets much worse if nobody <coughs> looks after you and, and there's, there's, a, there's a mix of medication that, that people have got as well. So hypothermia, dehydration, malnutrition and falls is the sort of well-being that we're looking after. We're trying to get people feeling better. The other things that are on there we can't do much about. Uh, loneliness, face-to-face -face talking to people is important, multiple medical conditions are important. Oh, I mentioned detox. Readmission is very expensive to hospitals. If somebody isn't too well when they're sent home, they may be readmitted. And the arcane way that the health service works, I believe they don't get funding for the readmission if it's within a certain period. So what we're trying to do is make sure when somebody does return home, right, that they are safe and unlikely to be uh, readmitted. Um, gatekeeper to getting people home and it's not you know it's, it's things like have you got handles by the toilet have you got a stair lift it's movement around the home have you got are the steps properly marked there's a whole host of things so the operate occupational therapist the OT is generally the person who takes the decision whether they can go home or not as often as not they will prescribe pendants alarm pendants um, they do the job wonderfully well for those people who are capable of remembering to wear them, remembering what the button is for, 
uh, and, and, and keep wearing them. But all too often, they're a cause of false alarms because some people have pressed the button because they wondered what it was. Some people have pressed the button because they know their daughter comes whenever they press it and they fancy a chat. Uh, but most of all, half a million of 1.6 million are never worn. It's a waste of money for a lot of people. Uh, about 80 million pounds. It's very difficult to get hold of the, of the figures. In fact, only 8% of the people who have got prescribed pendants wear them all the time as they ought to do. Usually worn means a fair bit of the time, but 30% of the people just don't wear their pendants. So that's one of the uh, criteria. And if you don't press your pendant, you don't wear it, and you have a fall, nobody will know. <coughs> so I'm saying part of the solution, not the whole solution, I called it assistive activities of daily living. Um, we do it by remote measurements from this box here, this smart power socket, temperature, use of the kettle, use of the microwave or toaster, where they're moving, it's got a motion sensor, it measures the power supply, if they have a, a blown fuse it will also detect that. Um, and other systems will have things like attachments to fridges, attachments to pill dispensers. So there's a whole range of, of devices that are intended to track people throughout the day and taking measurements throughout the day. Um, what we do need is, is good care plans produced by the OT or social services where people get home, organisations of these carers, families and friends, making sure that people are fed, watered, um, chairs, dinner frames, whatever it is, and telecare. So what, what we, we are doing and other people are doing is Internet of Things, IoT sensors in common everyday objects that don't frighten people. Uh, as people get older and more um, regular in their ways, very often they cannot stand change. They do not want to do anything different. They possibly have difficulty understanding technology, um, even telephones. People lose the ability to use the telephone. Perhaps they're blind, perhaps they go deaf. But skills go. There is this gradual decline that nobody can deny. Way. Right, that's it. <laughs> I certainly know that you've seen this before. It, it hasn't changed. This is the application that the family member uses. So they log on to the screen and if there's no changes in the normal patterns of behaviour, what we're doing is learning patterns of behaviour. If there's no change, you get a green dot for the hour. We analyse every hour and we look backwards over several hours to see if there's been a lot of changes. If there's one change, the hour goes yellow. If there's more than one change in the hour, it goes blue. The, the hour goes blue. So you can see very quickly if there's been a lot of changes. <coughs> the, if there's a few changes, the day is green, which is pretty normal. There's only one change in that day. These days, two or three changes, probably no problem. For the medium number of changes, the day goes yellow, amber, and if there's a lot of changes, we make the whole day go blue. Why did we use blue? As a colour. What other colours could we have used? Instead of red, we deliberately did not use red. Or well, you can have red if you like, because usually red is danger warning, something going wrong. Now, this is a real live example. Uh, this was a blue day. It was actually a very hot, sunny day. It was over 30 degrees in the uh, chap's kitchen, so it was higher than normal. The motion was less in the kitchen because he was outside in the garden and he took out a cold drink. He did have a cup of tea later in the day. So this blue day was actually a very good day. It was probably the best day in the week. And that was 
that's when he went and visited his family. So he was out. So as long as you understand the reasons, so the human brain, the family's mind, is part of the system. The interpretation of these numbers is the family. Uh, it does not involve a clinician, and that's why it's general well-being. It's not a medical device, not a healthcare device. Well, it's anybody who um, the older person accepts can look at it. Right? So it's normally the next of kin, and that next of kin is given the authority to share with other people, or the older person themselves can say, I want these people to look. You know, I'll have this son and that daughter, but not that son and that daughter looking. I've fallen out with them. Uh, correct, yes. There, there is a capacity uh, uh, requirement here. Uh, if they don't have the capacity, and there is a um, last power of attorney, that attorney could do it. Now, at the moment, there isn't really an official concept of a uh, Maybe that will come along. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, you just press on the day and it drills down into there so you can look at the details. Well, no, there's five things. <laughs> we've got motion, power, we've got battery charge, we've got power on or off. So we're looking for changes. Now, the, we want the user of the app to decide which ones they want to look at. So you can remotely program this device for which sensors you want to use. Right? But the, the, the mathematics works the same on any particular sensor stream. And we can add other sensor streams if necessary. Yeah, so that's just got those three, which I think they're the most important ones. Are you warm, eating, <coughs> drinking, moving? If you can do all those things, you're probably okay. We've got humidity on here as well. Now, that's on because some people will leave on pans of water or leave the oven on and, you know, you can get some quite dangerous situations in the kitchen. Um, we're also planning to link it up with a, with a smoke alarm, a wired smoke alarm as well. Uh, and again, that, that would report through immediately. So we've got hourly pattern analysis with tamper proof, report mains loss, can run a week without the power supply. Mains network and power actuation, we can turn heaters on and off, but we haven't built that in yet. Uh, everything's wired, so there's nothing wireless. It's meant for kitchens. We can send SMS alerts or push notifications if we want to. It's one unit, and uh, our partner, Wellbeing, <coughs> will give a 24 by 7 response. So if the family wants alerts to go to a call center, they can go to a call center. But the intention is not that it generally goes to a call center, it's that the family looks after it, because 24 by 7 response is going to cost somebody some money. Continuous data collection. Uh, that's me, and happy to answer any more questions.